It is found this morning, Mark 11, 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them that Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is March Madness. Has anybody noticed March Madness, the basketball season uh, with, with all the excitement leading up to the final two teams that's leading to a, a crescendo of, of basketball activity all the way to the national title? I'm a bit sad that West Virginia is not a part of that, but it's just not to be. And this year, there's the added excitement of uh, Kentucky possibly being an undefeated team, first time in many, many years. Notre Dame re really come close to putting an end to that last night if you got to watch that game. Everything that happens this day in Jerusalem is focused on exactly that kind of excitement, that kind of fervor in the crowds is building up to this great day. For three years, Jesus has been building his ministry to this day. For three years, he has healed the sick and the lame and the blind and the leprous for this day. After three years, Jesus has attracted one crowd after another to attract them to the, and tell them and teach them about the coming of the kingdom of God. So by the time that Jesus gets to Jerusalem, the crowd is primed and ready to go. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is not going to be a casual stroll into town. He came out in on a donkey to fulfill Zechariah 9.9 9 that says he, he come in on a donkey to fulfill that scripture in full parade mode, complete with the palm branches that was a reminder to the Jewish folks of Leviticus and the Feast of the Tabernacles. The text is parallel to Psalm 118 to acknowledge Jesus' arrival as the new coming of the kingdom of David that will be restored. Jesus comes as the one that has been predicted for centuries for the people of God. The people in the crowd that day, they had a decision to make on that day and the following days. And it's really no different today. You, you come here to make a decision whether you thought you come here for that reason or not, you will make a choice today. Actually, we make a lot of choices in our lives to believe, to believe and follow Christ or to deny and reject Christ. We make that decision. Every day we're called to make choices, mostly small choices. Most things in our lives that we do daily are not the kind of things that, that alter our lives in any real way. Most decisions are just not that way, but, but many small decisions made consistently have the same effect as a jackhammer in our lives. Soon they shape our lives. Eventually the decisions add up and we discover what Solomon said a long time ago, that it's the little foxes that we need to be aware of. Most of us don't do the kind of things that will land us in jail. Thank God for that. But spiritually, our decisions do imprison us, take the life out of us. Some of our decisions take the life out of our joy. Can you imagine two saintly mothers meeting in heaven one day? They both had felt the 
the, the joy of motherhood as their little boys warmed their heart. There's something about a mother and their little boy. Now, mothers love all their kids, but there's a relationship between a mommy and their son that's different. The first tells how she loved her son, how she adored her son. She goes on to tell how he was mistreated and crucified, and she stated, I would have gladly given, put myself in his place. The second mother dropped her head as she realized this must be the mother of Jesus. Mary looked at her and said, what was the name of your dear son that you loved so much? And she looked up and looked straight in Mary's eyes. I'm the mother of Judas Iscariot. I can imagine Mary embracing Judas' mother and comforting her in her pain. Judas is still a name that lives on in infamy and associated with being a traitor of Jesus. Did Judas have a choice? You can really have some fun with that question. You could get into all sorts of theological debates about predestination and, and free will and the omniscience of God, the all-knowing uh, characteristic of God. Does the fact that God knows the beginning and the, from the end, does, does that fact alone predestine uh, you to a certain fate or simply the knowledge of what will be, will be, will be? That's a debate for another time. I do know the ultimate plan of Jesus' mission was to restore humanity from Satan's grip. We do understand that, that our environment, to a great extent, uh, chooses, it, it, it lays the path of who we'll become in life. We know all that we come into the world with varying degrees of, of obstacles and, and opportunities. Some people start out with, with, with great barriers to improvement. It must be overcome and pushed past. Some come into homes that are born in poverty and very difficult situations. Some come into loving homes and others, others are born in, in tragic circumstances. What I'm saying is that our decisions that we make are not made in a vacuum, but most decisions are made as a product of very unique circumstances that's unique to each of our hearts. One of the most life-giving things that the Lord has given me over the past several years is the ability to imagine walking in somebody else's shoes. For what may seem like a poor choice to some, I, I discover when I'm walking in their shoes, I may have very well made the same decision. Not as a way to justify bad behavior, but a way to understand where somebody's coming from. Until you've walked in their moccasins, you really don't know what you would have done. We actively make decisions and reap the benefit or suffer the consequences of our choices. Other, we find, other times we find ourselves in circumstances that, that were just thrust on us. We had no control, no power, no say in the situation. The decision then becomes how, to, how do we react to those circumstances. As, as Paul Harvey used to say, the only difference between a tragedy and an opportunity is your point of view. We are products of our past experiences. We're products of the choices that we make. One student chooses to stay in school. Another does not. A young woman chooses a husband based on character. Another chooses a husband based on chemistry alone. One person raises their children in church Another is too busy with worldly pursuits on the Lord's day. We reap what we sow. We are a product of our choices. I used to think I was a man of indecision. Now I'm not so sure. <laughs> I, I run across a story. In, uh, it's actually in Wikipedia. You know everything that's on the Internet is always true. So Robert Frost was born in England, was in England. He wasn't born there. He was, was in England from 1912 to 1915. And he, he ran across and met a, a, another author. His name was Edward Thomas. And Thomas and Frost became close friends, and, and they would spend time together walking, uh, many walks together. And after he returned to New Hampshire in 1915, he sent Thomas an advanced copy of the poem, The Road Not Taken. Most of you have read that at some point. The poem was intended by Frost as a, as a gentle mocking of indecision. In other words, he really meant the poem to be funny. 
particularly the indecision that Thomas had shared with him about his inability to make decisions in their walks together. And Frost later expressed a great annoyance that, that most of his audiences took the poem very seriously, more than he had intended, and especially Thomas. He took it very seriously because personally it proved to be the straw, the straw that helped him make the decision to enlist in World War I. Thomas was killed two years later. Everybody missed the humor of the road not taken. Thus it became the joke that nobody got and one of Frost's best beloved poems that still speaks to hearts to this day. It was written in Old England and the poem was set in New England in the New Hampshire's yellow woods where two roads branch off in, in different directions, forcing a traveler to choose between one of the two ways and it ends by telling us that the poet took the one less traveled, and that's made all the difference. I have to believe that Judas had a choice. He reached the place in his life where the road branched. He could either follow Christ all the way to the end, or he could betray Christ. He took the latter. There are some that say Judas had no choice. Judas was a zealot, expecting a leader to rise up and and, and deal with the Romans and restore Jerusalem to her greatness. I think it's a valid option to think that, that Judas could force Jesus' hand and force him to react in some way. In other words, Judas grew impatient with Jesus and was going to force his hand. Who of us have not grown impatient with God, standing at the bedside of a sick loved one and wish God would just act? Or, or are you in the midst of a dark valley and you need an answer from God and God seems to be nowhere? Who of us have not grown impatient with God? And had we had the ability to force God's hand, we may have used it at times. Most amusement parks have figured that out very much, that we tend to be a, a fairly impatient people. So they figured out that on these, these huge rides, uh, the roller coasters, they, they put these, these lines, they, you, know, you know what I'm, back and forth. They'll fill a whole room up and you're back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Does everybody know where I'm back? See, they figured out a long time ago we're impatient people. So we've got to make these people move even though they're not going anywhere. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a treadmill. You go all the way down to the end of the building and it takes 30 minutes to get back up to where you started. And we do it, but we're happy. Oh, those rides move really quick, Rick. Yeah, right, you go back and forth, back and forth, over and over again. But often in our impatience, we lose sight of the most important things in our lives. We take our eyes off the prize. We focus on the trivial things in life. We major on the minor and minor on the major things in our lives. Sometimes we just don't get it. Does everybody know what that means? right over your head, like, like the senior citizen that was visiting his, his, young, his young daughter, and he asked her for a newspaper. And she smugly says, this is the 21st century, Pop. I don't waste money on newspapers. Here, use my iPad. The dad said later, I can tell you one thing for sure. That doggone fly never knew what hit him. <laughs> I, I, It might, seem, it might seem funny, but we're the ones many times that miss the point of what's happening all around us, and we miss the point. Waiting can be miserable. Judas saw all the, 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 the injustice in the world. He saw the least and the last in his community being abused by the Roman government. He was going to do something and do it now. In other words, Judas had a political agenda. He was going to see his way through. Judas saw the religious institutions. They weren't meeting the needs of the community. He was impatient. You can't be a follower of Jesus and not care about the plot of the poor and those the least and the last in our community. But the ends do not justify the means. We get so blinded by the agenda sometimes that we miss the point of God's love in the situation. But here's the important thing I think 
for this day. The important thing that I want you to carry with you, whatever reason you have rejected Christ this far in your life, it's not too late. You see, the same Jesus is being paraded by you today. You come here to make a choice whether you realized it or not before this day. Jesus comes being paraded before you on a lowly, on a lowly donkey to show you compassion and love. You can make a new start. You can let Jesus take the wheel. You can all by giving Jesus control of your life. You can do that. Your sin will be washed away by the grace of God of the very one that you have rejected all these years. And that's the good news. For this day, we're under God's grace. Unmerited favor for all people. There's no hell low enough that the grace of God cannot reach down and pull you out. The place does not exist where God's grace doesn't enter. Jesus came to save sinners. The most desperate and perverted sinners can experience the amazing grace of God. The amazing grace of God, regardless of where you've been today, there's room at the cross. There's room at the cross. Today is the day to choose between life and death. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Amen.